Let me give the, the, the talk I gave um, at, at, at Scala World, which uh, was, was kind of an advanced topic. Now, there are, there, are some, there are some things in here for beginners as well. So can I have a show of hands as to who considers themselves a Scala beginner? Not that, okay. <laughs> who, who, who would be intermediate? And, and who, who's been using Scala for, say, more than two years? Okay, so, so there's a kind of broad spectrum of, of uh, experience. What, what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll, show, you, I'll show you some, um, some new, new, new designs I've, I've come up with for, for, for ways of uh, do, doing a few things in a, in a, in a more uh, type-safe way in Scala. I'll show you both the, the usages and... and some parts of the, the implementation. Now, the implementations are, are hard and complex and, and use some more advanced features. So if you don't understand the features for now, um, you should hopefully appreciate the, uh, the, the usages, which, which are designed as much as possible to be, to be simple and, and, and easy. So I've got this, I've got this photo of a, uh, a slippery road, which I guess could be somewhere in Canada. And... Um, this, this is meant to be a metaphor for a lot of code that, uh, that, that gets written these days in, in, in any language. What I want to do is, is rather than have a slippery road that we're trying to drive down, to have some, 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 some rails or something that would, uh, that would keep us on the straight and narrow. But, but unfortunately, rails has been stolen from us <laughs> as, a, as a metaphor. We can't use that because it's associated with a dynamic language. So we're, we're just going to have to live with that. And... Uh, <laughs> See, see what we can do with, uh, with, with, with improving the state of software development in Scala using uh, dependent types. So the example I'm going to use throughout this talk will be parsing command line arguments. Can you show, uh, can I have a show of hands as to who, who has done some, some code that's involved parsing command line arguments? So it's probably more than, more than half, I think. So this, this, is, this, this problem's existed as long as shells have existed. And you'd have, thought, you'd have thought it hasn't changed much. There's probably not much more we can see in the, in the domain of, of improving this. But hopefully, hopefully what I'll show you is, is uh, new and uh, an improvement on, on, on much of the, um, many of the libraries that exist already. So here, here's an example. We've got, uh, we've got the ls command here. We've got three flags here, L, A, and H. Uh, long listing, show all, and, and human, human readable, or human, human readable sizes, I think. Uh, we're sorting by time, and we're displaying that to a width of 120 characters. I've used different formats here. This, this is three single character flags. There's a, there's a, a space here. So when this, when this gets passed as an array of strings, as it does to any Scala, or Java program, this is two separate uh, parameters. Whereas this one here has an equal sign, and it's passed as a single string. So there's there's some work to do to get that into a form that we can we can work with, which would be maybe a little bit like this. We've got the L, we've got the A, and the H, and those are all merely present. There's no additional data, so I'm using the unit type to represent them. Sort well, that's for now a string, and uh, we, we've got time there. Whereas width is, is an integer. So we, we, we're trying to get to a state where we've got some more type information on these, on these parameters. That's, that's our goal. So let's have a go at implementing an API for this. I'm going to call a method called parse on, on the args. This is an array of strings. And I'll try and pull out the sort, the sort parameter. So sort equals command line. This is the, the, the newly parsed params and I'm going to get the one that's called sort. So this is the first attempt. Hopefully that's not too, not too surprising. By the way, if, if you have any questions um, and I'm not running behind schedule, just shout out. If, if, uh, if, if I'm running late, then I'll, I'll, try, and, I'll try and notice and, and tell you to stop. Now, one improvement we can make, if we're, if we're accessing size, well, we know that's an integer. So we could, for example, specify a type parameter there to, to tell the compiler what type we're trying to pull out. So we've changed the API. We're now specifying a type here. And what happens behind the scenes is this will, 
this will resolve a, a type class which, which fills an implicit parameter there determined by this integer. Who, who's, uh, who's familiar with type classes generally? OK. So, uh, and, and similar number for implicits? Yeah? A few more maybe understand implicits than type classes. Um, what, what, what happens is, is the compiler goes and looks for something that will pull out an int or whatever type we put here uh, as, as specified for this particular parameter extraction uh, in, 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 in the scope of the, uh, wherever, this, wherever this method is called from. Now, sometimes you want to specify size with the word size. Sometimes just a lowercase s is sufficient. So our API needs to support this because it's, it's, it's doing the same thing whether you, do, whether you provide an s or, 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 or size. So we, we need to have this s here as well. But rather than repeat both s and size every single time we need to extract this, this, this size parameter, what we can do is define in advance a value representing the parameter we're trying to extract. So we call that size param. And in there, we specify the two possibilities for extracting. We specify the type. And now, we can use this size param multiple times without risk of, for example, misspelling size or, or making, a, make, making a, a, an accidental error. So our, our, our API is evolving. We, we've, we've made some progress, I think, in, in improving type safety. But I think there's, there's further we can go. First of all, I'm going to tell you about something called modes. Now, I don't expect many of you will know about modes. Does anyone, has anyone used them? So fewer, fewer people have used them. Several, several have heard of them. This is an idea I came, came up with uh, a few years ago when I realized that there are often many different ways we can handle errors and that we can, we can handle exceptions and failure. Sometimes we want to return a try of, of something where the success branch is the, the result and the failure branch is the exception that, that, that was potentially thrown. Sometimes we don't care about catching exceptions and, and we'll, we'll happily throw them and just return the straight result. Sometimes option is a suitable response. But, but how do you decide? Should, should the library designer decide which of these is most appropriate or should it be the, the person who's using the API? So I, I think it should be the, the user of the API. So what modes do is they allow us to use the same API. You write the API once. It's the same, same bytecode. The same API can handle failures from different contexts in different ways. Now let me explain a few of those things. A API, that, that is literally a line of code representing a, a, a method call. Not, not, not two different ones, one for option, one for future, just one. That's, that's the key thing. Handling them differently, that means returning a different return type. So either try of, say it normally returns int, giving the option of, uh, option of int, or try of int, or even future of int. These are, all, these are all possibilities. And when I say different contexts, what I mean is different lexical scopes in Scala, as, as, as defined by, by nesting and braces at the, at the most fundamental uh, syntactic level. And, and what it does is it, it, it works out whether that method call, when, when, when you call it, returns an x, a try of x, uh, an option of x, or a future of x. So this, this, this probably seems kind of magic. The way we make it work is just by importing an implicit. That, that's how, we, that's how we, 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 we determine it, determine the response for a particular scope. So we, we import an implicit mode. Now, the, 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 way, the way this works, and I'll, I'll give you a bit more detail in a second, is this sounds, sounds a little bit uh, ambiguous. It's, it's simple but advanced. I'm using three different features, or three, three advanced features, implicits, high-kinded types, and dependent method types. But I'm using each of those in a very simple way. There's, there's nothing particularly advanced about the way I'm using those three features, except that I'm using them together. I'll talk you through each one. Uh, by, by the way, modes are in the Rapture Core project. So Rapture Core is, uh, or Rapture as a, as a whole, is, is uh, 
the name I've given to a, a collection of libraries I've been developing for doing things like processing JSON, uh, IO, uh, a lot, lot of things that, that must deal with failures one way or another. Uh, parsing JSON can fail, reading a file can fail. So, I, I, so I, I've put in, in Raptor Core, the common project to all of these, these modules, the, uh, this idea of modes. So here's, here's an example of using, using JSON. I try and parse this string here. Now this will fail, obviously, because the, the array is not closed. Normally, if you, if you just type this, 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 is, this is typed into a REPL, for example. We, we, we type this in, and we get a, an exception thrown. That's, that's the default case. If you, don't, if you don't import anything, then calling that will, will give you the exception. If instead we, re, we, we import return try, the return try mode, this line is absolutely identical to the one on the previous slide, except now the return type is try of JSON. So I've transformed that return type into a different, both a different type and consequently a different value. Is anyone a little bit uneasy about this? <laughs> you, you, like, okay. Uh, you, you probably should be, because it's, it's a bit weird. But um, you, you, you quickly get used to it. We can, we can import return option, we get an option, exactly the same thing. Uh, it's a failure, so, so none is the return value. Or we can even return, uh, return a future, where this, this call is actually dispatched to the execution context, and a future of JSON is, is returned immediately, and will at some, some later point uh, complete. So we're not, not necessarily only changing the, uh, the, the, the return type, we're actually changing the way the execution is handled and, and, and which thread uh, it, it runs on. So the first of those three features I mentioned, dependent method types, this is probably one of the most advanced of the, of the three. So I'll, I'll, I'll read this out. Dependent method types allow a method to return a type which depends on the refined type of a parameter. So you probably don't know what refined type is. You, you probably do know what parameters are. But let's, let me show you an example. So here, here's, here's the trait for a mode. Inside that, that mode trait, there is this, this inner type, type return. Now we define a function which takes a mode for a parameter. And the return type, rather than just being int or string or something, we're going to say the return type is the type return, this one here, from m, which is this parameter here, which is a mode. Now, the, the way this works is quite, it's quite subtle. When you call fn and you, you, you pass it a mode, can anyone tell me what type that is? Come on, someone say mode. Some, yeah. Okay, let's pretend someone said mode. Uh, <laughs> so you, you, would, you would expect if you, if you, if you pass a mode into a, in, into a parameter that's expecting a mode that the type would be mode. Well, it's true, it is mode, but the compiler actually knows something more about it. It knows that it's a more specific type than mode. It knows, provided, uh, provided an M, it knows that the type of this is actually m.type. And it knows that this m has an inner type called return, which we're able to access within that, that method body as the, as the return type. So we can make the return type dependent on the parameter here. OK? I haven't included the actual implementation, because that's, that's, that's um, the less interesting bit. But, but uh, it, it, it obviously does need an implementation that somehow returns the same, the, the same type here. But that's, that's, that's completely doable. So here's, here's an example. We create two modes, x and y. One has a return type string, one has a return type int. Res1, we call fn with, with x, and the return type will be string. 
Res 2, this looks very similar to this, except, <coughs> except uh, we have a Y here. Y has the return type of int, and therefore we get an int. It would be a type error if we had string there. So the, these, 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 um, these type descriptions aren't changing anything. They're, they're, they're just there to, to illustrate the point. That's the first of the three features. Type constructors. Who knows about type constructors? I think probably more of you know about type constructors than you realize. They're quite, they're quite easy. So you're familiar with things like list and option. Now, list and option don't have instances. List of int or option of string have instances. So we call those proper types. But, but list without a, without a specification for what, what it's a list of, you, you just can't have an instance of that. Even if it's li list, list of any is fine. We, we, we've said it's any, but list by itself, either by itself, option by itself, they are kind of like functions in the type world that haven't been applied. So we call these type constructors because given a type, you can construct a new type using a type constructor. So given, for example, int, that's a, that's a proper type, give that to a type constructor, list, that's, uh, and, and then from that we get a list of int, which is another proper type. We can have instances of that. So what I'm going to do here is change the, the type from a proper type, the, the inner type from a proper type to a type constructor. And I do that by specifying that there, there is, there is a, a hole in this type that needs to be fulfilled. And then in my, my, my replacement for fn, I can, I can say that we are wrapping some type, which I've, I've arbitrarily chosen int here. So the return type is dependent on this, this inner type still, uh, except this is, now, this is now a type constructor. And finally, implicits, which I think is probably the easiest of the three. Well, maybe not the easiest, but the, the most familiar. These allow us to fill a method parameter without actually specifying the parameter, just simply based on, on the type of that, that parameter. So we have, this is all the same as before, but we now have an implicit mode. This, this parameter existed before, but I've just made it implicit. And the, the, well, the implementation is still unspecified, but the return type is, is the same. So if we created this try mode here, where wrap, we, we were wrapping a type T to, be, to, to mean try of T, if we call fn, this will implicitly grab this mode, because it's the one in scope. It will look at the inner type, which is uh, wrap of t, which is try of t. The little t here is int, because that was defined in, in, in the function definition on the previous slide. And hence, the return type is try of int. Now, this is basically how modes work. So those, three, those three features in combination give us, give us modes. <coughs> So I'm, uh, I'm going to tell you about a library I, I wrote a few months ago, which is it's quite small, quite simple. And maybe you'll see later on how, it, how, um, how it's relevant to modes. But I'm just going to talk you through, talk you through the, uh, what, what the library does. It's called I18N, in Internationalization. And it's for, for working with internationalized strings. So, who, who here, I mean, we're, we're in Canada, it's a bilingual country. Who, don't laugh. <laughs> it's, uh, so, so any application you, you, you develop for a Canadian audience probably has to have both French and, and English versions. Yeah? <laughs> in an ideal world. So what, what people tend to do is they have a maybe an external file which contains some strings with, with English versions and French versions. And then at runtime, you'll pass that file, read, read the contents, and use those strings appropriately in your, in your application. What Rapture I18N does, it allows you to define your text in, in code. So my string, we use the, uh, the string context 
feature of Scala here. So we, we prefix the strings with en, fr, or de, depending on the language. Other languages are available. And we say this, this string is either, it's either going to be hello, bonjour, or guten tag. Now the type we get from this, so this, this, is, this is completely inferred. The type we get is very interesting. It's an i-string, that's just an internationalized <laughs> string. But it has a parameter which is en with fr with de. So it's, it's the intersection of those, those three types. I'll, I'll explain this in a, in, 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 a, in a second. In fact, there's a slide for it. So we've got a single value representing all of these strings. So it's, it's a bit like a map. Nothing, nothing too surprising there. And for each language we've got included in there, we have a type dedicated to that language. So the types en, fr, and de are all traits which exist in my library. And it's the intersection of those types which we use for the type parameter. So intersection is the same as withing, withing them together, if, if withing can be made into a verb. And we keep track of them. Wherever, wherever we have an i string, it has a parameter, and we track the languages that are included in that i string. Any, any way you pass that value, we do that. And though, so those types are, in a way, stored, at least at least at compile time, they're stored in that parameter in an intersection. So here's, here's how this uh, is a more explicit version. We've got just the English and French here. We're calling a method called, uh, called pipe. The, the en hello is, uh, is an I string of just English because this is We've only got one language there. Likewise, only one language here. And this, this combinator combines them to give us an i-string of, of en with, with fr. So that's, that's kind of what's happening under the surface. Now, the definition for i-string, or at least the, the interesting part, here's the definition of the combinator, the, the, the pipe. Given the, the left-hand side of that, we've got, we've got this language one, so that was en in the previous example, and we, we, we uh, or it, if you want to call it oring, pipe it, to the right-hand side, which is another i-string with, uh, with the type L2. That was, that was fr in our example. So consequently, that, that is the result. You, you'll, you'll notice I'm being very lazy with actually showing you any, any implementations for these. This is all, all type-level stuff, and uh, we, don't, we don't really care about value-level code. That was a, that was a, a semi-joke. <laughs> we, we do still need to provide the implementations. So some more on uh, type intersections. So normally, if you, see, if you see a type anywhere in Scala, you probably expect there to be instances of that type. Like, if you have a list of int, probably there will be ints involved at some point. I mean, that, that's, um, that's kind of what you'd expect. So we've got types called en with fr. Do we actually have instances of those, those types? Well, no, we don't. But there are other ways we can use a type parameter like en with fr. We can use it as a bound on, uh, on operations. So for example, the, the, the get operation from, from that, that map, we can, we can use that type as a, as a bound on the values, or the possible types, should I say, you can get from the map, from the, string, the i string map. And because these, these, these are never instantiated, they're called phantom types. They exist at compile time, but not at runtime. They get, they get erased completely at runtime. So here's, here's what we can do with this. We, we've defined this string, same one as before. If we call say hi with, with a type parameter, no, this, isn't, this isn't, isn't a value, this is a type here, this is fine. It will give you hello. This will give you guten tag. Whereas if we try and get the Spanish, this isn't just a runtime error, this is a compile time error. So it fails before you even get a chance to run it. And that's because this, this type here is being used as a bound relative to this one here, which means the compiler will prevent us from ever trying to get uh, the, the Spanish ver uh, version from this, from this i-string. And here's, here's, here's a, a 
another kind of example of this, how this map works. This is the bound. This is the value we try and get. And this must be a supertype of the type of the map. So if you have a map, this is a different example. If, if you have a map which, which, uh, of uh, int with string, int with string means there is an int in this and there is a uh, string in this. It doesn't mean we have something which is an int and a string, because that's just nonsense. You, you can't have such a thing. They're, they're, they're final, and you just can't imagine it. But we can use this as a bound, the bound t, on the things we can get out of this. So get int is fine. Get symbol, get double, they won't work. Is that OK? So I will do a quick demo now. I hope. We have a REPL. So I'm going to import Rapture i18n. This is the project. And we can, we can have uh, a string here, um, like that. Uh, note, I've, uh, I, was, I was lying a bit about the type. There's, there's some subtlety there as to the actual nature of it. In the, in the library, it's a bit more complicated. But for now, the interesting bit is this bit here, en with, with fr. And we can say we can get the English version. We can get the French version. Uh, we can't get the Russian version. It doesn't exist. It's compile time enforced. Now, what you might like to do is say, well, let's have some, some text. Uh, now, we've got. Uh, an i-string here, and let's say we want English with French. And uh, can someone, someone give me an example sentence that we might have in our code? Anyone? Come on. Hello world. Sorry? Hello world. Hello world. It's a bit boring. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Uh, not the quick brown fox. Sorry? Yes. Say again? Yes. Yes is very boring. I'll, I'll do yes. We'll, 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 try, we'll try something else later. OK. So what, what will happen here? Will this be a compile error? So yes. Uh, <laughs> it is a compile error. We can't create this value because we, this is the wrong type. And actually, we get this nice, we get this nice error message here. So it tells us we need to provide the French version as well. Now, I thought this is, this, well, we've, we've done this, but could we, could we do even better? So what I did was I wrote Rapture translate. And what this does instead is it works out what you were trying to say, and it translates it for you. Shall we pick something other than yes? Hello, world. <laughs> really? Let's have cake. Let's have cake, OK. Ayon gâteau. No. This, this is, this is I, <laughs> so I, I was short on time. I didn't have time to fully implement the exact translations between, <laughs> between English and French. So I had to, I had to rely on uh, Google Translate. Does the Rapture library also support different spellings in, like, various languages? Because the color in Canada would be spelled with a U, but not in the States. Oh, it doesn't support that. No, it doesn't support uh, different. Um... Could you use ENGV versus ENUS, which would be the example? There are problems with that, unfortunately, in, in that. You, you would still want to fall back on either one or the other. Um, I think there are ways around it, but, but um, out of the box, no. Anyway, I've only got 10 minutes left, and I'm not going to have time to do everything, so let's, uh, let's see how far I get. So what we've done is we've, um, we've, we've defined a type, which means that if we try and access, uh, if, if something has the type en with fr, with, with de, then it definitely has those values in it. 
So that means that accessing those values is, is a total function. It's guaranteed to work at, at, uh, at runtime. It's checked at compile time and will fail there if there's any, if there's any problem. They're safe operations, and actually those, those modes I showed you before, we don't, we don't need to use them here. But there's a problem. In all likelihood, we will have some value coming into our system that represents a language, a runtime value. And we can't ascribe a type to that at compile time because it's not known. So something, something originated from user input has this, has this problem. And I mean, what happens if you enter, or the user enters a language which just doesn't, doesn't exist in our system? We, we need this to fail. So there has to be one point of failure. The way, the way we do it is we, we first of all, uh, it, here's, here's our language. We, we, we create a little parser. So we say, I want something which is either en or fr. So we parse a string. This one will parse successfully, which means that given, given our i string, we can then access the right value from that locale. And this will be typed with, uh, this, this type here must be uh, a, a super type of the type of high. So the, 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 the constraint is the same, except rather than knowing exactly which value we're getting out with this, we, we, we know that it's one or the other, and that we have to provide all possibilities. There's still a point of failure, but that is now the, the parse method. And it's, the best thing is it's a single point of failure. So we, we've, we've effectively reduced what I've called our slippery surface of error to a single point. OK? This is, this is a good thing. We, we no, now no longer have lots of uh, places through our code where, where, where these errors are, are, are dotted. Oh, that was where the demo was meant to go. So back to our command line API. And I'm going to be very short on time, I'm afraid. We could potentially use modes here. This is what would happen. So say we, we want to get the size param. That, that's the same definition as before. So we try and pass the arguments. But we, now we, we import return option. And we get the size param. And rather than getting just 10 or an exception, we get sum of 10 or, or, or none. So modes are, are helping right now. But here, here's, here's an example that we might have in a, in, a, in a hypothetical command called resize. It can either take an area, or it can take a width and a height. If you just provide a width, that's not good enough. If you provide only a height, not good enough. If you provide area and height, that's a bit ambiguous. So these are the two possibilities we want to support. Now the code, I, I just wrote some code down to, to hopefully deal with this. It's complicated. We, we, we try and access the width here and the height here, and uh, that, that's only if the area has failed here. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten lines of code, or nine, nine lines of code here, just for accessing those three parameters. That, that's too complicated. The problem is we're handling the failure here, here, and here. That's three different points of failure that we need to, need to fix. Could we reduce this to one, just one place? Well, what we'd like to do is to define a, an expression that represents the, the parameters we'd like to parse. So either area param or a width and a height. So that's what we do. We, we, we write this code, and we call dot parse. So this is like the en or fr, which we, uh, which we parsed before, except we've now got two different combinators. We've got ampersand and pipe. And we, 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 we pass the arguments, and we get, we get hopefully, a, 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 a result, provided the, the parameters match. Now, what I might have to do, I'm probably, uh, have I got five minutes? Five minutes. So I, I'll probably skip the complicated bit, uh, which explains the implementation. We use, we use a few things here. Uh, Products and co-products, and uh, what, what, we, what we'd like to write is something, something like this, uh, where, where, where we're combining these, these different things together to build a type that represents that expression I showed you before. Now, I'll, I'll show you what the type, what type we get. 
I bet you're glad you didn't have to go through those slides. This, this is, this is the, uh, the same slide as before. This is the expression. We parse it, and the, the result is this type here, coproduct of the singleton type area param, area param dot type, with, so we're using intersections again, a product, this isn't the product from, from Scala, this is my own, my own product, uh, of width param type with height param type. So by, by some complicated dependent method types and, and implicit, I'm, I'm creating this, this uh, instance of, of this, this quite, quite complex type here, which represents that, that parsed command line argument. Now, um, what we have is a value PS, which represents the, uh, the, the, the parsed version. Now, if it's parsed successfully, we know for sure that it's either area param or it's width param and height param. If it's not, then it, 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 it fails. It's an exception. Or if we had a different mode, it's, it's dealt with in whatever the modal way is. But now, every operation we call on, on PS is total. So this is, this is a coproduct. So it's either, it's either one or the other. So we need to handle, if, if, we're, if we're working with that coproduct, we need to handle both possibilities. So we'd like to write something like this. If it's, if it's area param, then do one thing. If it's width param and height param, do another. But this isn't, this isn't actually valid code. This isn't sealed. We, we don't know if there are other cases we haven't handled here. What we'd like to do is have the compiler tell us that, that we're guaranteed that if, if, we, if, we, if we check both of these possibilities, they will work. This is what you write instead. So ps.handle, and this is a normal, normal function call. It has two parameters. It actually has variable arguments. But each, each argument to this, uh, this handle method is dealing with one case. If it's area param, we handle that by getting the area param. If it's width param and height param, then we handle that by getting each of those and multiplying them together. So the result we get will be an integer. But the best thing about this is that it's, it's checked at compile time. If we, forget, if we forget to include width param and height param, then it's a compile error. If we forget area, it's a compile error. If we try and access area param here, that will fail because we're on, the wrong, we're on the wrong branch. So there's a load of complicated typing going on. This is all, this is all the stuff that gets inferred by the, the, the type system when you, when you write this down. These are the types of the things. This is what enforces those constraints. But we, 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 we end up with some quite, quite nice code that we can trust will work at runtime because it compiles. So all this, all this work, all this, all this additional typing, uh, which, which, I mean, you can, you can see here, but in normal usage you don't see, this gives us much more confidence in the code we write. It takes us from partial functions when we're dealing with user input to total functions. And when we're in the, when, when we're in the world of total functions, everything is safe and nice and, and, and we're happy, and we don't have to deal with exceptions. So what we've done is we've reduced the surface area of failure to a single point, which is the point where we parse the, the, except the, um, the parameters here. So I, uh, I'm, I'm out of time. I've, uh, I've, I've just kind of summarized this. Um, the, way we, the way we do this, we, we, we encode facts about the structure. Uh, Amanda was talking about facts, I think, earlier. Someone was talking about facts earlier um, it, that, that you can encode in, in, in types. This is exactly what we do. We, we encode facts about the, what, what's in that map, what's in that parameter map, to know whether it's safe to do operations. And we have the, the compiler enforce them. Uh, so this is all in Rapture CLI. It's work in progress, but it's, 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 it can still do useful things. I'm hoping to have it finished by the end of the year. I would love to get contributions if anyone's interested in, uh, in experimenting with it. 
One nice thing we get from defining in a single expression the, 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 the entire definition of the command line and the, the parameters is you get tab completion for free. So it does some, it does some clever stuff with, with those combinators to work out what, what tab completions it, it should send to, to the bash completion system or, or ZSH completion system. But we, 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 can, we can write a little application without, without any extra work that gets tab completion on, on those parameters basically for free. Uh, and rather rushed at the end, but that, that, is, uh, that, that is the end. <laughs>